Well, hello, hello there, Next Gen fam, and welcome to Mentor Moments with Next Gen HQ. Please sit back, take out your notebook, and enjoy what's to come. We are so very honored to have Michael Gibson on with us today to share a little bit about his entrepreneurial story. Michael is the general partner and co-founder of 1517 Fund, which is a phenomenal VC firm that's founding young entrepreneurs and really empowering them from the very start of their journeys. Before that, Michael worked with Peter Thiel for almost five years in a number of different ways, from research to acting as a vice president uh, and really everything in between. But Michael, we are so excited to have you on with us today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Michael has been a long time part of the Next Gen fam. I think, Michael, uh, you, you're longer than I have. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, it was at one of the first uh, events Danielle and I uh, <clears throat> attended. That is so special. We're so excited to still have you here. We kept you around. We're not letting go of you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is such a great community, so uh, we're not going anywhere. Thank you. I'm a little biased. I do think our community is one of the best out there. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we're going to start off with a little bit of a Next Gen HQ tradition here, just to get to know you with our rapid fire questions. So are you ready? Sure. Yep, shoot away. What is a book that you would recommend that others read? I just read Notes from Underground by Dostoevsky. So I, I, I really enjoyed it. I hadn't read it in 20 years. He's a, uh, a Russian novelist, a very deep thinker. Most of his books are like 600, 700 pages, but uh, Notes from Underground is, you know, 140 pages, so a little easier to tackle. Uh, but what makes it so phenomenal is it's like this first time in literary history, this three-dimensional portrait of, of uh, you know, twisted, strange psychology. So it's just a, a really interesting portrait of a, uh, of a torn man. So definitely recommend that book. I am definitely going to have to dive in. Russian literature is one that I <laughs> definitely don't have too much experience. Yeah, it's not really bee treating, but. <laughs> uh, well, on that note of, of beaches, maybe this will answer the next question. Where is your favorite place to work from? Oh, wow. Uh, well, right now I'm sitting in the very seat I work in every day <laughs> with, uh, with lockdown. But what I've noticed actually is, uh, you know, I'm a very introverted person. Uh, I, I do read a lot. I, I like to write as well. Um, but what I've noticed during uh, Shelter in Place is that I miss working in cafes. And, and it's not because I'm talking to people. I just miss the, the ambiance and, and the noise and the action. So uh, I'm not very imaginative. I love working in Starbucks of all places. If I'm on the road, it's just reliable. Uh, but nearby here, there are a couple cafes that are nice to work out of too in Venice Beach. One is called uh, Intelligentsia on uh, right on Abbot Kinney. That's a great name. I, I myself am also a cafe lover. Even have a tattoo of a coffee cup on my wrist. Oh my god, that's so, great! That. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And then final question for you: What does your ideal Sunday night look like to hit start for the week ahead? Oh man. Well, you know, in, in the last decade, I forget when the last season was, but I remember the show Mad Men used to air on Sunday nights. So that, that was always my favorite Sunday night was having something to look forward to like that TV show. Uh, not really have to do any thinking. I'm, I'm a morning person. I'm much more productive man. So by the nighttime, I just want to uh, sit back and relax and not have to do anything. I love that. We're definitely going to have to get you on another interview and just chat about how to be a better morning person. <laughs> okay. I would love to know. <laughs> like Lady Gaga says, I think I was just born this way, so I don't think there's uh, I don't have any tips. <laughs> Amazing. Well, now that we're, we've all warmed up to each other a little bit more, we're going to dive down into the good stuff, Michael, into um, what has led you on this fantastic journey that you're on and, and all those good things. Uh, but I want to start from what is probably a little bit back into your history before you worked with Peter, before 1517 really became the organization that it is today. Uh, you were definitely drawn into the world of academia. It seems right. like you were on your doctorate studies at the time when you decided yeah. that that wasn't quite the path that you wanted to go to, to go through. So mm -hmm. what was the final push that really encouraged you to say, this isn't for me, I want something different. And what challenges might you have faced when you did make that decision to depart the world? Right. Uh, you know, I was very naive as a 18, 19 year old. I, <clears throat> I, I would read a lot actually. And 
some of my favorite writers, like one in particular, the poet T.S. Eliot. Uh, I can remember, uh, you know, reading his poetry and loving it. And then I saw, I would, you know, on the back of every book, there's a author's biography. Usually it's about a paragraph long. I noticed Eliot said he had a PhD in philosophy from Harvard. Um, another writer I like, uh, Tom Wolfe, journalist from the 60s and 70s, I noticed in his little biography, he had a PhD in American studies. And I was just, in my head, I was like, you know what, I need a PhD if I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> and it's so stupid, uh, because you only get a PhD if you want to become a professor. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I did get drawn into the subject matter, and I loved it. Uh, I spent years, but but it's it's very hard to find a career as an academic. Uh, it can be a very long period. I spent many years alone in libraries, uh, and and I and I came to a point where I actually I, I thought, okay, I don't want to be a professor, meaning I don't want to grade papers and teach classes. I really just want to write books and uh, maybe contribute to the world of ideas. So I, I can recall I was just reading in this bookshop. I went to Oxford University for my uh, graduate stuff and. Um, and, and I just decided, I was like, wow, you know, I was reading these journalists from the 1960s, Joan Didion, Gay Talese, and I was like, you know what, you, these people didn't have credentials, they just became journalists and, and wrote. So that's what I decided. I was like, all right, I'm out, I'm gonna drop out. And I, <clears throat> I, I was dating someone at the time who lived in Boston. So I moved there and I just happened to get a job. I got lucky, there was an opening for a magazine, they were looking for editorial assistance. And it was uh, owned by MIT. It's called Technology Review, and it's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So that I, I after I was working in a cafe for for two months uh, as a barista and as a, you know deliver, delivering the food and the drinks to people, and, and that was really hard work. And so when they called me and they said, "Oh, do you want to interview?" I was, I was really excited. Uh, and then I got the job. So I didn't I didn't have a background in science or technology, but that was the the purview of the magazine. And uh, it was a baptism by fire because I had to cover all sorts of different things. I had to write stories on quantum computers or, you know, one guy, one time I wrote a story about a guy who invented a better way to brew beer. So really uh, a lot of different things. And, and so at that point it was like, okay, I, I don't know, you go to grad school, you become a journalist. And then I came into, uh, it's like, I started volunteering for an organization. I wrote a story about some pe some people who worked for PayPal. And then I, I, I somehow just got pulled towards uh, Peter Thiel. Yeah. And then I found myself talking to some people who worked for him. And uh, they mentioned there was this job opening. I was, I was freelancing as a writer then, but because he was this interesting person, I said I, I was interested in it. And then I wound up in an interview with him and we were just talking about philosophy. So uh, we just got along really well. And at the end of that, he said, uh, hey, you wanna help me teach this class at Stanford Law School? Uh, I said, yes. Um, and then he said, in the meantime, you can help out on the research on, on, on the hedge fund. So like th this line of events that I just told you is like, you know, all just being at the right place at the right time kind of thing. A lot of luck involved. You know, my interest took me places, but, but it wasn't that I set out to, to say, hey, I'm going to become, um, you know, start a business or something like that. It was just like I had my interests and then it led me towards that. I don't know if there's a lesson there. <laughs> I think there's a lesson in everything, and especially uh, with how that journey kind of started out for you. You thought that you were going down one path and, and being a writer and feeling as though you were in need of a doctorate or, or yeah. more studies, but being able to say, you know what, this isn't, this isn't working. This isn't really okay. kind of what I wanted. I think there's a lot of... Yeah, that was a big decision, right? I mean, because I put in so many years. Um, you know, there are a lot of expectations that you build for yourself. There are stories you tell your friends and family, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, you know what, I'm not doing this. And then, so that, that's a big change. And one that's going to inspire many people when they listen to this, and then I'm sure <laughs> I'm going to ask you to share more on that. <laughs> I do have to say, though, T.S. Eliot, big, big fan. The Love okay, Song cool. is one of my favorite works, <laughs> for sure. It's a very literary interview now. <laughs> <laughs> But so kind of that was the that was the beginning part, and that was how Peter Thiel was really introduced to your life, and how you found a very new way for your passions and your interests to come to life. Uh, but flash forwarding kind of to where you are now, throughout your professional journey, it seems that you've really enveloped into this mission of inspiring and empowering young entrepreneurs, and really encouraging them to think 
a little bit more outside of the box and, and right. maybe pushing them to think that they don't really have to follow into the paths that for years and years have been told that this is, this is what their journey should look like. Uh, did you find yourself kind of facing a big moment of awareness in which you knew that was your mission and you knew that's what you were really being called to do? Yeah, that's a great question because I have to go back to some of the, the things that I studied and why I studied them way back. And uh, yeah, so I, I studied philosophy and, and I was drawn by the big questions. I was drawn by, you know, do we have free will? What does it mean if we don't? What, what would it mean if we did? Um, and, you know, in, in those conversations about that kind of topic, it's, it's always, you know, are we, are we puppets and there's some kind of strings pulling us from behind and determining our actions? Um, are we living according to convention? Uh, or are we self-authoring our desires and, and guiding our life? And, and, you know, I think if I think if, if there's a theme that runs through a lot of what I do, I think it's continuing that thread where I want people to just be more conscious of what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I do think free will is free, but I think it's, uh, I think it's really hard. So uh, I think there are all these influences that pull us in different directions. And, uh, and maybe we just have to struggle to figure out what's, what's really our, our, not by, you know, are we doing things by convention or are we doing them because it's true to our nature or what we truly want? Um, so that's like general. And then, you know, having worked for Peter and, and we launched the fellowship, it, it really did start to focus on uh, the question of what careers people have and, and, and the trajectories they take in their lives. And certainly within the U.S. over the last 20 years, but maybe even going back further, um, it just became this monolithic path for people where if you were talented and creative, then it was just assumed that you had to go to college. Um, if you didn't, it was almost as if you had a dunce cap on your head and I hate the way America denigrates the trades and so on. So we started this program to really question like, Hey, can we get people to reflect on the choices they're making? Uh, so, so yeah, that was the background of the program. And then, and then in our day to day work, yeah, we're talking to people and, and uh, since we're helping them start businesses, it, it really does uh, come to a fork in the road about that. It's like, Hey, why do I want to do this? Is it because, I want to be rich or is it, I want to be famous is because, uh, you know, my, my parents want me to do this or is this just, you know, some calling I have that I can't explain and I can't shake those questions come up all the time. Uh, and I want to do what I can to support people in, in those decisions so that they, uh, they feel like they're making the right one. It also seems like the earlier that those questions really come to someone's mind is, is a little bit of an easier time than if you were, 10 to 15 plus years into a career and then you're kind of having these, is this what I really want to do? Is this, oh, yeah. why was I called to this in the first place? Right. It happens. I mean, I, I look, I'm, I'm 43 now and I, I'm not, you know, I'm really, I, I love what I do at this point, but I meet a lot of people who are my age and, and they're still thinking about, Oh my God, maybe I should make a, a career transition. I don't like what I'm doing. So the question comes up often, but I think it is of, of, paramount importance you know you, you're in your 20s you're just starting out and you're figuring you're trying to figure out what to do it could it could definitely set the, the course of your life exactly and thank goodness that individuals have 1517 fund and your community and everyone that you're kind of fostering to be able to have these conversations with because i think that's that's part yeah, of that's the beauty of next gen I, I, look, when we started this stuff in 2010 that none of this was around i mean no one was talking like this uh so I think the, the it's so, uh, yeah, it's great to see the support out there. It really helps all the different people, you know, tons of people having these conversations in ways that they didn't in the past where it's just acceptable or okay to think about it. I love this, uh, you know, we're in perilous times right now, but it's fascinating to me to see people willing to take gap years now to, to try different things because they don't want to pay sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 for Zoom lectures. Um, I think, yeah, I think in terms of the ability to talk about the issues, that's moved quite a bit and then if i think about uh, the number of people so the role models out there i think there are many more of them now you don't have to be steve jobs you, people are perfectly capable of crafting um fulfilling and rewarding careers outside of institutions now and on that note of crafting a rewarding career maybe i'm putting words into your mouth but i think that's that's what i would say that your career has definitely been for sure uh, and there's been so many experiences that you've had 
uh, you're a co-founder, you're a general partner. I know for a fact that you act as a mentor and a guide to so many founders mm -hmm. and startups. You've been a teacher at educational institutions, kind of a pretty, a pretty big gamut. But do you feel that in all of your experiences, um, there's been one major lesson that's kind of really stuck with you and still remains relevant to who you are as a leader today? Hmm. Wow, that's a tough question. Um... We like the tough questions. I, 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 I guess you got to trust your feelings. You're, you you got to trust your intuition. And I'm not, and I don't mean by that your uh, re re reactive, re you know, reflexive uh, answer to a question. I think some of these tough questions about life are, are things like the phrase, hey, I got to sleep on it. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that because what you're trying to do is to, to figure out how you feel about it. And oftentimes uh, you, your body and, and, uh, your psyche and stuff, it'll work on the question while you're not thinking about it. And I start to, th I, I'll even feel something shift in me where it just feels right. Like, hey, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And, uh, and yet I, what I find in life is it's, it's sometimes the, the noise can drown that out. So uh, I, I do encourage people to develop a practice um, of somehow reflecting on these things, which ties into another, maybe it's not like a positive lesson. It's more like a, a negative challenge that I find in life is uh, there's this phrase called boiling the frog. I, I've looked it up. It turns out that the, the phrase actually isn't true. So there's this story that if you throw a frog into a boiling pot of water, he'll jump out. But if you put a frog into a lukewarm uh, pot of water and then turn the heat on, he'll stay in there because he won't notice the, the temperature change over time and then he'll die. All right, so that turns out that the frog will jump out. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's a real problem in life in different ways from like romantic relationships to jobs we have where slow, imperceptible changes over time are difficult to track. And then after three, four years, suddenly you find yourself in a place you never expected and you don't want to be. Uh, so I don't know. I did, yeah, I don't have any like tactics or practical advice on, on how to solve that problem. But but yeah, I think it's tied into taking time out to, to see how you feel about things. And for some people that might be going on a hike or meditating for others, it might be something else, but, but I definitely encourage people to find something to, to listen to themselves. Quote unquote, sleeping on it in whatever way kind of makes sense to that individual, whether it is sleep, whether it's meditation. Yeah, right. It's for them. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I mean, on that note, as far as creating and, and hopefully inspiring a generation who does really kind of listen to themselves and their intuition and kind of what, what they really need to hear, um, what would your hope be for the next generation of leaders to come? What would you like to impart to them? Oh, man, I think there are a lot of challenges out there in so many, so many ways. I mean, it's like things could be better, they could be worse. Uh, but it's going to hinge on what people decide to do now. And, and so I would say really dig into the problems out there, whether it's, you know, future sources of clean energy, whether it's uh, the environment, whether it's social issues, just like you got to You got to have a dedication to fact and truth and you got to dig hard. Uh, and, and we have to solve these problems. Otherwise we're, we're in a lot of trouble. So uh, don't be afraid to, you know, don't be a well-rounded person, get narrow, dig into one of these, these problems and, and, and that'll be uh, enough for a lifetime, I'm sure. You heard it from Michael himself. Dig into one of these issues and really help to create an impact that's going to change the world. Michael, thank you so, so very much for coming on to Mentor Moments with us. We so appreciate yeah, you me. This was fun. sharing your story. If someone is interested in getting connected to yourself, what you're doing at 1517 Fund, hint, hint, the Invisible College is fantastic. Where should they go <laughs> find some more information? Yeah, so come to our website at 1517fund.com. We have a form submission. You can fill that out or you can email uh, our team, including me. It goes to me and Danielle and Nick, uh, info at 1517fund.com. So info at 1517fund.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on socials, you can find uh, me, Danielle, and, and, and the others on Twitter and follow us there. I hear it's a party over on Twitter too. So. <laughs> well, that's come with a health warning. <laughs> Go reach out to Michael and the rest of the 1517 Fun Fantastic crew. And Michael, we're going to let you go for now, but we're looking forward to even more conversations to come. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks. Bye, everyone.